Well, welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, everybody. Uh, hoping you're enjoying yourselves and you anticipate watching the show. Uh, my name is Ray, and I will be reviewing some modern, up-to-date, and some classical Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. The first book that I'm going to be reviewing is Super Sale on Super Superheroes, book three. Let me try that again real fast. Super Sales on Superheroes, book three. She sells seashells by the seashore. Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, that is written by William Arand, narrated by Nick Padell, and has a length of an exact 12 hours. Felix smiled and leaned to one side in his chair. He looked from the microphone, which hung between himself and the rabbit-eared beastkin, to the camera behind her. He waited for the next question. This in-between time from question to question often got cut. Mr. Campbell, this next one is a bit of a loaded inquiry, so I apologize in advance, Erica said, giving him a broad smile, her brown eyes and soft features inviting him to confide in her. Other than her dark black hair having grown quite long, she hadn't changed since he'd first met her at the company picnic. Bright, energetic, and cute. It was no wonder her news segment had become extremely popular in Wall. That went for the entire country, not its same-named capital city. Everyone loved to watch her, and she always seemed to get the best stories, the most hard-hitting interviews. Didn't hurt that she always looked stunning on the television. Norwin Legion hand-feeds her every story of interest, now does it? Please, don't worry about it. I'd expect nothing less from you, Miss Newberg. And I knowingly accepted your invitation to the interview, Felix said playing into his role, despite knowing your predisposition. Well, my friends, this is a very bittersweet time for me. Uh, as I finally get a conclusion to a very beloved series of mine, uh, I have to say, um, the very first Super Sales book, uh, I, I found it just because Blaze Corvin was talking up, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole thing on one of the Facebook posts a while back. And I'm like, what the heck is, you know, Super sales on super, it was SS, whatever, you know, the initials are super sales, so S-S-O-H-O-S, or whatever it is. Um, anyway, and he was talking about me, he's like, oh, it's, it's this fantastic book by William Moran, you'll love it, get it. So I, I picked it up and I was like, oh, immediately sucked in, it was so amazing, it was so brilliant. Um, this book is the third book. Uh, and, and Rand writes in trilogies. Now, it doesn't mean he can't come back or he won't go back to a previous trilogy, just that he hasn't done that yet. Uh, if you look, you have the Selfless Hero trilogy, and then, you know, you have Wild Waste, and you've got, um, you know, this, this series. There's a number of things that he's, he's just now getting completed. Um, and I know a lot of people say a lot how he is, you know, gathering Avengers or something along those lines. And I don't, I don't believe that's what he's doing. He is, he is trying to get people that can help run or, you know, do things. But, um, the series is just, it's been like really fun. Um, and, and this book is filled with action and blood and battle and schemes and sacrifice. One thing that it really lacked was pancakes. Uh, just so you know, Andrea, amongst other things, really takes a back seat in this book. Uh, and most of the other female characters, you know, Kit and, and Lily, and the, they're barely visible, barely visible. They pop up periodically for very brief appearances. Um, and I don't want to add any spoilers here, but I will tell you fans of the Wild Waste that um, you should pick this book up as things from this series tie very directly into that series. Uh, so you don't want to miss it. You know, if you like Wild Waste and you don't read Super Sales, you probably want to get this book just because there's a very, very obvious tie into Wild Waste. Uh, and by that, I mean, this is not, I repeat, not a brief cameo. Uh, this is an actual sign, I think, that Arand is finally beginning to pull his books together in a far more definitive way uh, than we've had in the past. So if you're a fan of any of his books that he has tied together, and I think the only one that would be separated from this would be Cultivating Chaos, is, uh, you know, so if anything he's, he's written so far, that they, they all can tie together, and they do in some way, uh, you really want to get this, because I think this is the starting point. Uh, this is like the time that Nick Fury appears at the end of Iron Man, you know, the very first Marvel movie, and he's like, hey, I think... Uh, 
I'm putting together a team, and I think you'd be good for it. So um, this is a lot like that. This is the first step in the overall sequence that we're going to be building up. Um, but it's it's very clear in certain terms that the universes are all very much tied together, and they're going to be connecting for this big finale in some way. Um, so I'm really excited for the event. Now, on, on that note, I hate to say this, I was a little disappointed by this book, so I'm just going to come out and say it. Um, there were issues that I had, and starting with Felix barely uses his powers. And, and I mean, like, three quarters of my fun always came from the way that the, the, the creative things he would do using his abilities. And I loved watching him give people powers and amping them up and dialing down and seeing what worked. Um, honestly, aside from one police detective, I, I don't think he modified anyone or did much enhancing at all. Uh, the biggest use of his power was bringing back dead members from his team once. Uh, now, I really love Felix and his girls, but there was not a lot of super action here. Lily and Kit did very little. Andrea, almost totally invisible. Uh, the book seemed to be dominated by one new girl from Vince's world. And truth be told, it felt like this was like one long date book interspersed with some fighting here and there. Felix was taking someone out to dinner most of the time, and if he wasn't doing that, then he was struggling to stay ahead of his, his opposition. Now, another thing that kind of disappointed me was that I had been hoping to see uh, in book three that Felix finally go against Skipper. Now, again, this is, this is you know, one of those things where he had to make a decision. Um, Skipper is the main bad guy in book one, makes an appearance in book two, does a little threatening stuff, and then moves on. So I figured book three, we're going to see some some resolution to that conflict uh, finally come to a head. Uh, it, it didn't. And, and that's what kind of made me curious because the book leaps five years. Like, you know, usually a book picks up right after the, the last book did. This one does not do that. It picks up five years after the fact. So there would have been five more years of him struggling with Skipper and all these other things that were going on. But it, what's really weird was not a lot has changed since the end of the book two. Uh, everything kind of say stayed right in the same pattern as before, uh, which was weird because the relationships hadn't shifted, the paradigm hadn't changed. Uh, everything, you could have just just said it hadn't had a five-year gap and it would have been fine. Uh, you could have said it was a year later and it would have been fine. The five years, it was just really, really weird. Um, so it was what it was. Um, Felix is pretty much neutered through this book, and all the girls are suddenly shoved aside for this newbie in his life, uh, Felicity. And the way it ended while trying to tie things up, it just did not hit my buttons. It was not a very proactive end, and I can say is that it didn't have the same tonal quality of the first two books. Um, you know, and, and if you want me to be honest here, here's my complete breakdown. The book picks up five years after the end of book two. Nothing has changed. Uh, we do learn that for some reason the gods of Earth had decided that Felix is a D-bag and that they want to do everything in their power to stop him. One of the things I loved about book two was the way it changed directions so deftly. It made you think that it was heading here and then there, and it, it was all over the place. It shifted gears and took off that you didn't see coming. Uh, here, it didn't happen at all in book three. In this book, Legion is under assault, and it never lets up. Um, Felix and the other never, ever have time to catch their breath. And again, we lose all the girls, except for Mew, uh, Mew in favor of Felicity's new assistant. Uh, the superheroes were practically non-existent. Uh, and, and that was like a big thing in books one and book two. There was a lot of dynamics with the supers. That was cut out. Uh, and I just don't understand why. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that just happened. And, it, and, and there was no definitive villain that opposed him in this book. Uh, they were looking for three people that were trying to do things to him. But there was no big bad. There was no looming threat other than this could happen or that could happen. It just didn't seem to be at the same level of danger as the first two books. Um, you know, but I don't know. Uh, it, it saddens me to say this is probably the weakest of his books that I've read. And as much as I love his stuff and this series, he took away too much, took away too much and threw in new stuff. Um, you know, either leave Felix's his powers and, and take away the girls or take away the girls and leave Felix's powers. Don't do both. Um, and, and, you know, we had dragons and we had Felicity and we had dryads that were filling in. There was a lot of things that just did, did not gel 
it just felt like it was an entirely different book. Um, and, you know, Skipper, who was built up, menacing one and two. There should have been more to happen, but like I say, that's a creative choice. Um, the lit stuff is almost non-existent here. Uh, and so this sort of traipses into becoming a sci-fi novel rather than lit. Like I say, tonally, it did not fit with the other books. Uh, the book does have some good action scenes, and Zombie Mew is perhaps my most the most touching part of the entire book. Uh, but the, in the end, uh, this was more of a political intrigue novel interspersed with Felix on a date or fighting for his life in some way. If you love Felicity, the new girl, then this is going to be a great book for you, uh, since she pervades it more than any other character. She does so in such a, I don't want to call it a creepy way, but it's a creepy way, where every girl there is like, you should sleep with Felicity. Uh, that I was so certain that she was a villain who had come to infiltrate his HQ and get close to him to maybe kill him or do whatever. And I don't want to say one way or the other, but if you don't like Felicity, then Tough Cookies, because she's here to stay. She is everywhere in this book. Uh, I guess for Nick Padell, this was a great book because he didn't have to do the voices of any of the girls from the first two novels for very long. Uh, there were a lot of new ladies that he could characterize on his own. So I know he was still playing, you know, like balance out like how Jeff Hayes had done his voices in the first book. So here he had like a bit of free range to finally play with the voices. Um, and, you know, he did not have to replicate, for example, Andrea's energy, uh, which is like one of the most fun parts of the first two books. Um, he does play a fine Felix and is an amazing narrator. And he does his utmost to keep the book as exciting as possible. He had no issues. I had no issues at all uh, with any of his work with his book. I'm happy to have him here. If I can't have Jeff. I will take Nick. Uh, it's, it's a secondary substitution, but you, you got to get what you can get. And I think Nick does a good job for how he does things. Now, I know it sounds like I hated Super Seals. I didn't. I didn't. It was a good book. However, it was not a Super Seals book. It, it just did not have the same tone the characters uh there was no lit rpg aspects to it hardly at all there was a lot of things that just kind of got gutted and i don't know what happened because of that i don't know you know if it, because i know some people say well he's trying to, to merge these books together and he had the wild waste people coming over from yosemite and things like that and you know that 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 could have all worked just the same without having felicity Without having Felix have no powers, well, you know, with, without a lot of those things happening, it would have worked just as well. Uh, so I don't know what was going on other than he maybe needed Felicity in there for something to free up Andrea and the others. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and like I say, there's sacrifice here at the end of the book. Um, but it was one of those ones where uh, I really can't say that, like, if you read the Selfless Hero trilogy, uh, there's a there's a loss there. And you're like, <gasps> It got me right in the feels. I can't breathe. Here, uh, the, the sacrifices that took place, I really, 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 it barely affected me, which is weird because they were two of my favorite characters, two of my favorites, and I was like, well, <laughs> they weren't here anyway, so what difference did it make? Um, so I'm going to give this book 7.5 stars um, because I do love this series, and I, I trust I trust William Moran to come back and kind of go back to what we loved about Felix. I don't know if it's going to be a, a Wild Waste mesh up uh, with Super Sales or not. Uh, I don't know how he's going to proceed from here. But I'm going to trust that everything's going to work out for the better in the future. Uh, but this book, it, it, like I say, it was probably the weakest in this, in this whole trilogy so far of, of all the books I've read of his. Um, because... This one stumbles so far afield of what the originals were. I just don't understand it. I really don't. Um, it's still good, but it cannot come close to matching the energy of the first two novels. And the lack of powers being used by Felix made this go from being the literary genre to simple sci-fi. So 7.5 stars, and that's a goodwill half point. You know, half, half, the point five is a, is a goodwill star uh, because... I do enjoy it, you know, the books, the series, the characters, and William Moran a lot. So I'm giving him a good will, you know, half point. Uh, but otherwise, th this was just kind of like a, a sad thing for me because it just did not fit the rest of the series. All right, so next up, I'm going to be doing The Artisifer, a lit RPG adventure, The Imperial Initiative, book one which that's a little misleading, and I'll bring it up in a bit here, uh, by S.R. Witt and James Hunter, narrated by Matthew Broadhead, 
The book length of 11 hours and 7 minutes. Several levels down from the ventilation plant, Osmark reached his next stop. With a wave of his hand, another steel blast door swung open on silent hinges, revealing a stark white hallway, which connected to a darkened chamber. The security guard was halfway out of his chair before he recognized Osmark. I didn't know you were coming today, sir, the man said with a sheepish grin. Relax, John, Osmark said. I'm just making the rounds. His last stop had been all about cooling things down, but this room was for heating things up. OLED panels lined the walls, each displaying information about a critical subsystem. The center of the far wall was what drew Osmark's attention, though, because it gave a readout of the whole system at a glance. That display had a tiny pictogram representing the salt mine at its top. A thick tube led from the mine down to the Earth's vast darkness, the mine's geothermal well. It descended more than ten miles below the Earth's surface to a vast lake of superheated pressurized water. That water, heated to almost 500 degrees Fahrenheit, was pumped up to the power plant under intense pressure. The steam generated turned turbines, which generated electricity. As the water cooled, it flowed back to the lake that provided it. The closed loop was efficient, nearly perfect. It would keep electricity flowing until the end of time, powering the overmined servers, which ruled Verdian... So, I guess I'm going to say first off, I think that this is not a series. Uh, this is just going to be a one-off kind of book for James Hunter and Mr. Witt, uh, because they really haven't done anything with this since this book came out, and it's been a while. Um... So I think that it was just kind of a one-off to get you set up for this is like a this is a prequel, but not a prequel to the Viridian Gate Online series, uh, because it comes out, you know, a little bit after the, the Viridian Gate started. Um, but it also tells you the story of, you know, Osmark. So it is it is a prequel, but it didn't precede the the, the, the story. Anyway, you know how you can tell do you, just, do you know how you can tell that James Hunter is an amazing author. It's because one, he can make you appreciate and sympathize just a little bit for one of the nastiest villains this side of Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Osmark is a huge jerk. He's an a-hole and a scumbag extraordinaire. But this is one anti-hero who has reasons for every move he makes. Um, you know, and that's the thing with with scumbags and evil villains. Uh, they never start off as being like, you know, if you, and I hate to even do this, <sighs> look at the Star Wars prequels. Darth Vader was not an evil son of a bitch uh, at the beginning of the stuff. He was just this little kid that was kind of lost, and he, he gradually had things happen. He made choices that made him into a villain. And that's kind of the same thing here. Um, he makes little baby steps and takes little things happening that he has to, he has to sacrifice morality in order to achieve certain things. And he, he does this and slowly becomes the Osmark that you know in the series. Um, by no means does this book negate his asshat status. Okay. Uh, that he earns in the VGO books, but you get a better handle on all the, his motives to a small extent and see what pushed him to be the way that he is by the time you get to, you know, Viridian Gate. Uh, two, I'm back to Hunter now. Hunter is a writing chameleon. He easily, easily adapts his writing style to match whomever he partners with. And so the, the transition is, is fairly seamless. He's co-authored a lot of books, and they all feel as if they are written in one singular voice. So, you know, Wit and Hunter... Um, I don't know who came up with what, how things started, how much... I don't know how much James Hunter actually contributed how much he didn't i don't know how much wit contributed didn't um but it, it really is tonally it's one voice it's a pretty solid storytelling technique right here and i'm always impressed because i say the same thing about aaron crash and hunter with the war god series because it's all one voice if you want to hear another one voice look at rogue dungeon eden you know and and, and hunter it's it's Two different people, and it's all one singular voice, one singular tone. And they all change because they're not the same tone as Viridian Gate. So I'm, I'm always impressed by that sort of stuff. So here, for this book, let me get back to this. What's the sit rep? Okay, Osmark knows that the world is going to end long before the general public. And he takes steps to ensure not only his survival, but as many people as he can get into his, v, you know, 
VR world. Uh, the problem is, is he meets resistance along the way, a lot of resistance. You know, there's political types, and he has to, you know, start making maneuvers that make, you know, things that make your mother cry. Um, so he has to outmaneuver politics and politicians. Uh, he's got to, you know, get help and money. Even though he's got cash, um, he's got to go to the seedier side of town to get some money to make things happen and make promises and deals. Uh, so, you know, I guess this is done kind of make him more sympathetic and, and see that things are not always black and white. Because if he didn't do these things, then, you know, we wouldn't have a VGO series uh, because the world would have just been crushed by the asteroid and that would have been it. Uh, so this made me kind of hate him a little bit like like Norman Bates in Psycho. Because, you know, Norman Bates is like this swell dude. Uh, he's quiet. He takes care of his mother. He likes birds. And you get to see how he gradually goes from like being you know, doing minor evils to being a full-blown bad guy. You don't really see it happening all at once. You don't know it's there. And then there it is. He's suddenly in his, you know, the, the mother's dress and wig with a knife stabbing some poor chick in the shower. Um, so... You know, that's that's kind of how Osmark is. And I think, you know, with Osmark, I don't know. I don't know if Hunter is a fan of comic books. I don't know if he's read like Superman or Spider-Man. But I can almost say that like Osmark is kind of an amalgam of Lex Luthor and uh, Norman Osborn. You know, the guy that's Green Goblin. Because Luthor is a solid businessman. So is Osborn. Uh, but Osborne kind of goes crazy once he, he gets his powers. Luther doesn't ever get powers, but he is just brutally efficient and does what he needs to to succeed and win at all costs. Now, Osmark was not quite that bad, but in the end, he kind of had to have that kind of, we need to do this or it's all over with kind of uh, attitude. So you can see, you know, I, I really feel like, you know, there, there's a lot going on here. Um that you you could almost say he got these right from the comics, and and it's more of an homage. I don't say I don't think he lifted anything directly. It doesn't didn't I know he didn't. Um, it doesn't feel that way either. Um, but Osmark really does not ever realize he's chopping his soul into pieces. Uh, and by the end of the book, he he doesn't have much of a soul left to spare. So if you ask what it is that passes for action here, because this is this is your big question, right? Um, this is the real world. This is not the VGO world. Um, when do we get excitement? When do we get this other stuff happening where, you know, you're like sweating bullets over things? Um, what I can tell you, without spoiling a lot, is he does have to contend with some hired killers, you know, who are after him. And he has to recruit some, you know, f financiers from the scum of the earth. Um, and one of his recruits is actively planning to take control of VGO away from Osmark once they're inside the game. So he's got a couple of things he's got to deal with and fight along the way. There's there's battles he goes through. And, and then maybe they're not, you know, um, Vogthar warriors or anything like that. But it is interesting. So don't go thinking this is all business dealings and boardroom meetings. It's not. It's not. Now, don't get me wrong. The book, the book is pretty amazing, and it ties right into VGO, leading right up to a point where he first hears of a certain fellow named Grimjack. Now, I can totally see, you know, if there was another book, it picking up somewhere after their encounter and showing us everything that he had to deal with, you know, like our man Jack and Cutter, as they try to stab off his military advances. <clears throat> and I really would like to see that. I, you know, I know James has a slew of other books coming out based on other characters and, and things like that from the VGO series. I think Osmark could carry it. I, I think you could have a book with the villain as the main character and do it right. But again, I'm always I'm always saying that. You know, I think you can have a, a monster be the main villain. Shaklak. Mm -mm -mm. um, anyway, um, but I think you could have Osmark be the villain, but still be the main character, and you know, you can see what he's doing rather than. <clears throat> You know, just just from Grimjack's point of view, because even when they team up in the, in the Grimjack's book, um, you're getting hit Grimjack's point of view most of the time. Um, if it had been another character, I would have probably been rooting for this guy all the way. Uh, I still love the book and hold it to the same standards as VGO, but, you know, Osmark is a D-bag. He's a total D-bag. So in spite of the time, it just looks like this is a one-off book, and I'm really sad to say that. I could have taken another book written from Osmark's POV, 
as he struggles against Grimjack and all the Doom and Deathbringers and Vobthor and, and all that. But it is what it is. Now, Broadhead, um, Matthew Broadhead, the narrator, who is not Armin Taylor, the narrator of the VGO series, narrates this book. And I think it was a smart move to have a different voice, so to speak, to tell Osmar's tale. Uh, this way you don't think of Osmar as being Grimjack, only as another character. Um, it really sets up both series and main characters, sets them apart. Um, I would say the Broadhead is never really quite on par totally with Taylor in this book. But he, he has some skills and chops, and he keeps things balanced. And he does a fine job here. Now, with me, Broadhead is usually he's a hit or miss. Um, he's either really, really great, or he's really, really bad. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the writing style or the quality of writing. But there are some books I've, I've listened to, and I'm like, I can't believe Matthew Broadhead read this because, you know, uh, Warscapia. I just... Uh, <laughs> But then there's Bathrobe Night series, and I think he was really good in the Bathrobe Night series, as opposed to Warscapia. So I don't know, I'm a little biased on how 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 he is because I think he's either really great or he's really bad, uh, and I haven't seen him hit a middle ground yet. So it is what it is. Um, for overall quality story and narration, it's like holding a mirror up to VGO. That's the best I can say. Uh, so if you like VGO, you know Viridian Gate Online, uh, you'll see they're the same but very different. They stand apart very well on their own. But you'll like this book a lot. You'll like it a lot. I'm going to give it 7.8 stars. Uh, so go get it today. So the next book I'm going to be doing is Dungeon Desolation by Dakota Kraut from the Divine Dungeon series. Uh, narrated by Vicus Adams with a book length of 11 hours and 55 minutes. I am thinking of visiting an exotic location. Perhaps finding a secluded island and being revered as a god by the local women. Sounds like fun. Adam smiled and looked over at Rose, who was not paying attention to the conversation. Any plans, Rose? Hum? Oh, aim for the head, I guess, she responded somewhat distractedly. I... I meant after the fight? Adam stammered as she turned her attention to him. Oh! She was silent for a bit. Get some dinner, I guess. One way or the other, I don't see this war lasting too long. There is a mana haze here that screams the most powerful people in the world are present to me. So, I'd say dinner time is an accurate guesstimate. A uh, what now? Tom interjected. I am unfamiliar with this word. Guesstimate. Rose cocked her head to the side. A guess. An estimate. A guesstimate. Why do people have to keep changing the language with weird mashups? Tom grumbled. I have a hard enough time with it as it is normally. There are just too many consonants. Sounds like a bunch of snakes hissing at each other. Well, Dakota Kraut finally returns to the Divine Dungeon after a far too long period of time. Now, I really, really miss Dale, Cal, and Danny the Wisp. Naturally, nothing remains static, and a lot of changes take place in a short span of time. So, without getting too spoilery, uh, Dale loses a lot, Danny pretty much mommies it up, and Kyle tries to deal with the plan to gather the world's energy via a network of ley lines that he has constructed. So, I have to say, I do believe this is the penultimate book. It's the second to last book in the series. Um, it was a little bit of a letdown in some spots, and, and it, I hate to say it like that, but Two of my favorite series, um, the latest books. I just, I know, I just told you, Super Sales on Superheroes. Um, I was a little disappointed with that one, um, the way things turned all of a sudden. And it's the same thing here. This book, um, it just, it just did things in a really strange and odd manner, and it did not feel like a Dakota Kraut novel. Uh, I don't know how to say it any other way. Like for example, Kyle sends Dale and his team to retrieve a dungeon core. Uh, and, and there really wasn't much to the encounter. Um, a cult worships Cal and springs up, and he does very little with them. Um, Andy commandeers another dungeon core to run some of his levels so he can focus on his big plans. Why he even bothered, I don't know, because it's never really mentioned after he does it. Um, it's like, I want them to focus on the first four levels of the dungeon so I can do other things. He really didn't need it because he wasn't doing Jack anyway. Um, it was just weird how it worked. And, I, and I'll, I'll talk about all that in a bit here. Um, but it, in the meantime of all this other stuff happening, there's this huge necromantic army 
that is just killing everything in its path, and the Adventurer's Guild is tasked with stopping it. A lot is happening in this book, and we don't have, you know, a lot of focus on anything for very long at any point uh, until the very end when we get to the big army encounter. Then we kind of get like a spotlight put on it for a little bit because we do get some fighting scenes going on. Uh, but it, it's all kind of just scattered all around and willy-nilly. And um, there's no, I don't know how to say it. The entire book is basically Dale and Kyle getting pushed around and scrambling to stop a horde of undead and a triple S level madman. I honestly felt like the series would have been better served with the book centered on just the undead horde and then the madman and then to the finish without the fallout of the encounter, the, you know, would, you know, finish it up with the fallout from the triple S or whatever happened there. Uh, for example, there are deaths that are just totally glossed over, events between party members and re revelations about the big bad necromancer that, I don't know how to say it, uh, there should have been more time focusing on these things, and it just seemed like it was just, like, boop, it happened. And I I'll argue and say, in his defense, in real life, that's the way things happen. Just boom, 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 you don't have time to think sometime, you don't have time to blink. This is a novel, and so you can take a breath and f flesh it out a little bit more. And I think um, Dakota Kraut is not afraid to flesh things out. Uh, you know, the Completionist Chronicles, they're, they're pretty long. They're, they're very in-depth and detailed things. Um, so any of those events could have had a bit more time spent on them to flesh them out and detail them. It just it wasn't there. Now, in Xenocide, on the other hand, um, Xenocide went from being just like this nutcase to being the biggest danger in the whole world. Uh, I would have expected a little bit more buildup before he exploded into being the biggest bad of all time. Uh, this The last half of the book, just it felt so rushed, so rushed. Um, in fact, the entire necromantic war, which was built up pretty heavily, I mean, you think about it, I think the first book, if I remember correctly, there's like this hint of this dark dungeon and this necromancer, you know, oh, we're going to go do this. Um, it was building up for so long, and it pretty much ends with a whimper. The whole necromantic war ends with a whimper at Xenocide's appearance. Uh, you know, Xenocide is just this crazy mad guy that uh, can pretty much do whatever he wants. He's almost a god, and he's trying to, to elevate himself a little bit higher here. Uh, and, and the other issue I have is, is that Cal does not do much in the way of being a dungeon in this book. Dungeon building or creating new monsters for the, you know, for most of the book. There's, you know, one really small section where he creates new elementals. Um, and that's it. And, and that was like a really great part. I love that part a lot. Um, but otherwise, there's no new dungeon layers, no new monsters, no killing adventures. And, and I realize, you know, the way the story was going, you couldn't throw all that in. But, that is what you you have read the last several books for was for those aspects. You, you read them for the, the dungeon part. Uh, and my third favorite aspect is just Dale navigating the act of building a town while trying to level up. And we lose that aspect of things because my second part is Danny interacting with Cal, um, which here we're, we're pretty much limited to them just discussing this little wisp they have now, their little wee wisp. Um, it's basically just... Danny mommying things up for the most part throughout the book. And then when she does contribute, finally, it, it felt like that was how things should have been going the entire way. Um, so like I say, those are the things I enjoyed and it, they were all kind of sucked away because you had no monster building or dungeon leveling uh, creation coming up. Uh, there was not much in the way of Danny and Kyle interacting, you know, as dungeon and wisp. Um, and Dan, um, Dale running around trying to do something for the town or make it better or stronger in some way. All that got swiped away. And I, and I understand why he did what he did with, with Dale. Um, I really hated it, though. It was just really one of those things where it came out of the blue. And I don't know if there's a reason. I mean, I'm sure there's a reason for it. But I absolutely hated it. I hated it 100%. I did not enjoy it. From the moment it happened till the end of the book, I wished things were changed before the book closed. Um and like I said, I love Dakota Kraut. And, and this is where I'm saying, like, to me, this is like the weirdest, weirdest reviews that I have gotten in the last couple of days. Um, 
for books that I love because I love Super Sales on Superheroes and I love The Divine Dungeon. If you ask me to name two of the greatest books ever written, I will name those two books, you know, Divine Dungeon, uh, you know, Dungeonborn, and I will say Super Sales number one, two of my premier books. And it really makes me scared now. I've been waiting so long for Delvers to come out and now I'm terrified that something's going to go wrong there. Um, just because I don't know what happened, but you know, Kraut stepped away for a long time and has been doing things with other books, and he has Mountain Dow Press. And I don't know if he, he was just rushed to get this done. I would have rather he took another year to get this thing squared away to where it was really good, and and it felt like it should, rather than putting it out because this book totally feels rushed to me. Uh, it also feels like it was pieced together because, just as an example. When they go to the first dungeon, the underwater dungeon, I expected to have like actual dungeoneering events take place. And it was kind of like they were in this room, they were in this room, they were in this room, they had the dungeon corner out. That was it. And for it to be like this really old, pretty powerful dungeon, there was not a whole heck of a lot going on there. Um, and the same thing with the, the volcanic dungeon. There was nothing that happened there. We didn't get even see anything there. Um, it, like I say, it just it, this feels like this this was pieced together. Um, it was more Dale's story than it was Cal's. There's never a reason why you know as much as I love Dale, Dale should be the hero of the story. This is the Divine Dungeon series, uh, and Cal should always always come first. Uh, so I don't know. It, it, it's just it's one of those weird things about everything. It just it just felt like. Dale had so much going on, and Cal had very little. Uh, and when he did have things taking place, it was it was not as interesting until we got to the elementals. That felt like the old stuff, and it felt really good, and it felt natural and normal. Uh, everything else that he did was just kind of ah, uh, you know. Even when he he broke ranks and, and, and advanced a little bit, even then I was kind of like that. Just okay, he did it. He just did it. It was no big deal. I I got more out of. Dale advancing than I did with Cal. Um, but I don't know. It just, it just felt like he had to get another book out, another dungeon book out to keep us from riding. That's the way I looked at it. Um, I just would rather he held off a lot longer. Now that said, I did enjoy the novel. I mean, you just can't get the same old thing every time. Uh, and I was happy with what I got for the most part. Um, I can't say that it was, it was, one of those books that after I read it, I'd have been like, rah, rah, this boom, bah, this is the greatest book ever. I would have said I, I read it and I enjoyed the book, uh, and that would have been it. And it would have been one of those books I could have put on the shelf and, and not walk back to. Uh, the battle was pretty cool, and I loved the way that Dale rebuilt himself. The good moments that were there were great, but they seemed to be pretty few and far between. And hey, I get there wasn't a lot of room, you know, for the dungeon to grow and kill adventures. I really get that, but you know, Dakota Crowd's pretty creative, and he could have done something with Cal other than what he did. Just really, you know, he, like he sent Minya down to get the Volcanic Dungeons core. Uh, there, there was, that's all there was. It was. Just go get me the core. There was no struggle or anything like that. We don't even get to know the core, get to meet the core, but for a few seconds. Again, I don't know the purpose of having those other cores taken. Other, I mean, I do know the purpose of it, but to have the one core, like, take over part of his own dungeon that seems a little crazy to me because that's his dungeon and he needs to you know do things with it and to put that in somebody else's hands kind of like well i'm pretty much done here I, i'm not going to pay any attention to this stuff it was just really strange and it was very uncow like uh cow i don't think would have ever sacrificed an inch of himself for anything and the reasons behind it if there were really good reasons, they weren't well explained. Um, Vicus Adams, as always, is fantastic. Always. I love his rendition of Danny, and, and that is my favorite voice that he does. Um, I will give him credit where credit is due and say that he plays every character as if they were just as important as the main characters. He nails the humor and can jump from silly to full-blown action in less than three letters. Okay? Not, not miles per hour. In three letters, he can do it. Because uh, he's reading things. Um, but uh, as, as much as I, I liked what he did, uh, he just could not save the book overall. I, I think that the book is just, it's just rushed and it's, 
And it feels like it's kind of stitched together from certain things. Like, you know, here's an idea here and here's an idea here and we'll go with it. Uh, again, just, I hate to say this sort of stuff, uh, cause I do love this series. I love this series. I, I really respect Dakota Kraut. Uh, just same with William Moran. I can't believe I did this this last time. I, I think they're amazing writers. Both of them I just really do, but. Rushed is rushed, and I don't think as much attention was paid to the series as it deserves. Uh, I think that, you know, the Completionist Chronicles and maybe some stuff from Mountain Dog Press, you know, with Advent. Cause I loved Advent, by the way. Uh, again, uh, it was amazing. But, you know, running the business, I can almost see, like, here's where Mountain Dog Press came into play. And, you know, we have to get all this stuff done here. Um I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not putting it on that, but I could just almost say that I could see that that be the case. Uh, because this book does not feel like a Dakota Kraut book. It just feels um, like something he popped out, because you know, even the humor uh, that you usually have, this was not his typical funny, funny humor. It was kind of like, ah, dad jokes. Okay? Uh, and I hate to sound like that. I truly do. Uh, so I'm going to just close up before I dig another hole for myself, because like I say, I really like Dakota Kraut just as much as I like William Moran. And I've really hit these guys hard with these last two books. So I'm going to just bow out while I can. The final score is 7.4 stars. Uh, it pains me to do that, but I felt a little cheated on the dungeon building, and even Kyle's screen time was just too short. Uh, we have a bloody battle that ultimately becomes meaningless, and a big bat that just popped up and took over the rest of the book at the end. Uh, you might like it more than me. I don't know. I, I don't know if I have issues or something that I'm, like this week. Maybe I'm just off of my listening, but I really feel like there was more to this, or there should have been more to this than there was. This could have been a fantastically amazing book. I think it was too short. I think that there was not enough put into it. And I, like I say, it was just rushed. It was just not up to standard that I usually expect from Dakota Crowd. And I'm really sorry about that, but 7.4 stars. And I'm going to say this again for the second time today. This is the weakest book in the, the Dungeon series. The weakest book. It just, it just did not have the oomph that the other books had. And that's, and I don't know. I, that's where I say I, I'm all for the trilogies. Yeah, you, know, you do the three books. And if you need to do another three, you do another three. This year, you know, coming in at number four, it just seems like we, we, we've gone too far. We could have closed out last time and been satisfied for a little bit and come back and picked up with Cal doing other stuff. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, Dakota, but 7.4 stars. Okay, gang, bear with me. That's all I ask is just bear with me. This is a new segment in which I'm going to talk about different books. I call this segment, by the way, Game Worlds. So I'm going to talk about different books that are based on video and RPG games. The requirement for this is that it has to have either been a video game or a role-playing game before it became a book. Okay, that's it. So if Chaosium put out an audiobook of H.P. Lovecraft stories, it would not qualify because H.P. Lovecraft was a novelist or I should say it was just a story writer, uh, before they ever took over and became a role-playing game. You know, Call of Cthulhu is not a game that was created just unto itself. It had information there. Um, Dungeons & Dragons, on the other hand, totally fair game, created by Gary Gygax. I could do Greyhawk, I can do um, anything from WOTC, uh, you know, Ravenloft or Spelljammer, those things. If it's an audiobook, I can talk about it, you know, whether it's Gamma World, um, but it also goes for other things. So, God of War, Five Nights at Freddy's, it has to have been, has to have been a game before it was a movie or TV show. So, I'm sorry, but there will be no Manimal, the role playing game books, okay? No audiobooks from Manimal. That's just the way it has to be. This has to be a purely video game or tabletop game before hitting print. So if they did an adaptation of Battleship, that would qualify because Battleship was a board game before it became a movie. And it became a movie before it would have become an audiobook. 
I, I could have done that. Okay, I'm not going to. Even if they did make an audiobook of Battleship, I'm surely not going to, and under any circumstances, ever, ever review that sort of stuff. So, I would generally cover one book series, one book from a series, and then leave it at that. Um, I may come back to something else later on. Uh, but today, today only, I'm going to cover multiple books. As before, it is my intent to draw you in and broaden your awareness so that you won't, you know, so I won't score here either. Um, but it will, my scores will be on Audible. So look there if you want to score. But I want to draw you in to say, you know, this isn't lit RPG because the gaming um, effect, uh, effects don't pop up in the show, um, you know, in the book itself. It's just about like what happens in that world. So I could do World of Warcraft um, and that sort of thing uh, because it's not lit RPG. I'm still going to just review those just so you can kind of get a flavor for what those other books are like. You should be able to say, is there a game book out there that I can read and, and have fun with? So today I'm going to review one of my favorite, favorite um, book series of all time all time. Uh, I'm going to be reviewing Dragonlance. I'm going to review six books. I'm going to just kind of smash it into one thing and give you one review to it. Um, it is going to be Dragons of Autumn Twilight of the Dragonlance Chronicles, book two, Dragons of Winter Night, book three, Dragons of Spring Dawning. Then I'm going to go into uh, Dragonlance, The Time of the Twins, War of the Twins, and T T Test of the Twins. Uh, now these are written by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Uh, the first series, the, the Dragonlance Chronicles, is narrated by Paul Bomer. Uh, the second series is narrated by, narrated by Axe Norman. And the books average a length of 20 hours or less. Okay? So uh, there, there is some, you know, some are 14 hours and some are this. But it's about roughly 20 hours or so. So 20 to 15 hours per book. Tico Whalen straightened her back with a sigh, flexing her shoulders to ease her cramped muscles. She tossed the soapy bar rag into the water pail and glanced around the empty room. It was getting harder to keep up the old inn. There was a lot of love rubbed into the warm finish of the wood, but even love and tallow couldn't hide the cracks and splits in the well-used tables or prevent a customer from sitting on an occasional splinter. The inn of the last home was not fancy, not like some she'd heard about in Haven. It was comfortable. The living tree in which it was built wrapped its ancient arms around it lovingly, while the walls and fixtures were crafted around the boughs of the tree with such care as to make it impossible to tell where nature's work left off and man's began. The bar seemed to ebb and flow like a polished wave around the living wood that supported it. The stained glass in the window panes cast welcoming flashes of vibrant color across the room. This is a series, and this is a really rare series. Um, it's kind of like, I can't talk about Return of the King without doing the whole trilogy. You know, even maybe talk about The Hobbit for a little bit. I'm sorry, my son just kind of came into the room and was annoying me so I could not think. Because I don't know why he's down here doing this as I do this show. Because he knows he's supposed to be away from me as I do this. And it's not prop guy. It's my other son, my doofus. That I, so, yeah, you're a doofus, by the way. I don't know. What did you bring down? Show me what you brought down quickly. The Warhammer. Warhammer. He brought me Warhammer books. I do audio books. And he wants me to do the Warhammer books because he likes Warhammer. I actually have a Warhammer book that I will be reviewing at some point in the future. So thank you so much, Mr. Logan Bain Batman Johnson, for doing that for me. Okay, thank you. Yes, I can do Warhammer because it was a game beforehand. Very good. You listened to what I said and you picked up one. Thank you. Um, so I, I apologize for my lack of train of thought for a few seconds there, but he was like dancing around doing stuff. And I was trying to get rid of him, but he won't listen to me. Um, anyway, uh, the Dragonlance stuff is very in it's integral to each piece. You can't just do one book um, and say how good it is because each book builds from the previous book. And I'm going to say the, the, the last three books in this series are some of the best pieces of literature I've ever read. I mean, honestly, 
I, I still, I, I go back and read these books once a year, one way or another. I have them on audio CD, I have them on MP3. I have these books, uh, the original books, you know, by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. I have great big thick tomes that collect all three books in each series and the, you know, two separate books. I have, uh, you name it, I've got it. If Dragonlance is there. And on that note, I'm going to say, after you read these six books, if you get these audio books, stop. Just stop. Because everything else that came out from there thereafter was just crap. It was a cash grab by TSR and then World, uh, you know, WOTC, Wizards of the Coast, uh, to <coughs> cash in on like this huge franchise of awesomeness. And it should have just been left at those six books. But everybody, including myself, clamored for more. You couldn't, you, you could have just wrote crap in a book and thrown it at us and we'd have bought it at that point. Um, it didn't matter what it was. Everybody had prequels. Everybody had short stories and, and, and anthologies. And um, they had, you name it, they put it out there. Crin just went from greatness to crap overnight. Um, but these, and I'm even saying this, that includes Dragons of Summer Flame. And Weiss and Hickman wrote that, okay? They wrote that as well. Skip it, because it's awful. It's horrible. Just bizarre. They have prequels that kind of tell you, like, what happens in between the, the first three books, because there's events that take place kind of off-screen, and they filled those in. And they never should have done that. They never should have done that, because... Uh, I don't know what happened between the two of them. The writing quality just went right down. Like I say, they wrote Dragons of Summer Flame, and they crapped out. So here's the story. Uh, it basically centers on a standard adventuring party. This is a like you know a new D and D world um, that they wanted to get started, um, and basically they just wanted a, a, a simple everyday adventuring party. And so it has a half elf, elf ranger, uh, which is Tannis half elven. A wizard, Raceland Majir, a thief. Well, he's not really a thief. Don't call him a thief because he's not a thief. He's a kender, a uh, tasselhop burfoot. There's a knight, Sturm Brightblade, a dwarf, Flint Fireforge, a fighter, Caramel Majir, twin brother to the mage, and a swordstress, Kithiara, and a barmaid, Tika Whalen. Now, other characters do pop in and tag along from time to time. Like there's Gold Moon and Riverwind, and there's Gilthanus and you name them, and, and they'll pop up. This is the core group. This is the core group I just named off. So the premise is pretty simple. The The band of heroes I just named um, kind of decide to go looking for signs of the old gods. Gods who had abandoned the world of Kryn long ago after an event called the Cataclysm. Uh, they've heard tales of true healing occurring, and true healing can only be done by clerics of the old gods. There are these people called the Seekers who try to fake it, and you know they're trying to make their own religion now. Um, and the Seekers are gathering power as time goes on. But the the heroes kind of go out looking for information, anything they can find about the old gods, and they agree to meet sometime later back in their home town. Uh, at the leaves of the end of the last home, which is just like this, this old, you know, bar and grill kind of thing here. And as soon as they show up back in town, a couple of things happen that don't bode well. Uh, the first is is that they're beset by this big snotty guy named Lord Toad. Uh, he's he's a hobgoblin and he is threatening them, and they they kind of chase him off. But the big big issue they have is that one of their members, Kithiara, never comes back. Uh, and Kithiara is the half-sister of Caramon and Raislin. So, you know, the, the way things go, they're in the leaves of the end of the last home, and uh, an event of true healing actually occurs in the inn, okay? And that's when all the crap just kind of breaks loose, hits the fan, and the heroes all go on the run because this act of true healing it does not bode well for anybody. Okay, uh, and from that point, they go on this series of adventures, trying to do what they can to stave off, you know, the return of these these evil dragons. Uh, they find out there's a, there's just monsters that they hadn't ever heard of before called draconians uh, that have suddenly appeared. Um, I mean, it, the the story is so full of humor 
and gravitas. Um, I mean, there is so much emotion in these these characters, and and that's the strength of the story. Uh, as broad and as sweeping and as powerful as the story itself actually is, it is the characters that carry everything. Everything. Uh, just you know, this compares to Tolkien, Howard. Burroughs, Lovecraft, um, it is tethered, even though it's so broad and sweeping, tethered by the personalities of these characters. Now, the first three books see many changes uh, in the, these characters. That is just, it is shattering. And by the end of the first series, not all of the characters are still alive, and not all of them tread the path of light. Not all of them are the people they started off to be. There's a lot of things that happen, and this is where I say, there's, there's a reality to this that just kind of transcends, you know, your average, this is a game style book, okay? Uh, this game world is intently, intently well thought out, well played. I mean, I know that uh, having talked with Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman at Gen Con a few times, um, both in panels and then afterwards, and getting to watch them literally physically play the characters in skits, um, the, the, the characters themselves were based entirely, entirely upon um, the the role playing sessions that they had, and the, the the people that played those characters. So you know, when you see Tasselhoff doing something, it's because the character was played by a person doing those things, and, and it was realistic. And uh, Raceland, you know, with his whisper, they didn't expect that sort of stuff, and and that kind of stuff. They had no clue when they said, "Here's your wizard. Here's your fighter. Here's this." Um, these people took those and, and they turned those personalities into what they are in the book. Uh, so you got to give the role players credit. So that's where I say this is like this this convergence of perfectness that happens. Um, it's just amazing. And, and this series, um, the characters stand out so well. I mean, like seriously, um, I don't think there's a series in. I mean, I'm not sure a character in the original party. And I don't count Tika as being in the party, so to speak, um, because she's just there tangently for most of the time. <clears throat> but there is not a character in this story that you aren't amazed by in some way. They're very real feeling, but there are some standouts uh, in this thing. I mean, you know, Tasselhoff is just like probably, I would say Tasselhoff and Raceland, because I, I really, Raceland and Tasselhoff, are two of the best fantasy characters I've ever read anywhere, uh, bar none. I don't care who wrote it. I don't care if it was Burroughs or if it was you know Howard or you know Tolkien. Uh, you, you can talk and, and say Tolkien's great because he did start it, but to me, Dragonlance is far superior a tale compared to Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings has a lot, and I mean a lot. Uh, plot holes in it if you really step back and take a look at it and I love Lord of the Rings and I can talk to you about it all day long but there are just like every time there was trouble well we'll just call the, the Eagles in and that just drove me crazy here you don't have that you don't have that here at all um, and, and the second series so far outstrips the first it just blows the first series away um, basically here it focuses on two of the, the characters from the first book. Uh, it, it focuses on Caramon and his brother Raceland the wizard. Uh, and this is just, it's an intense book. Although Tasselhoff is there and, and the other characters too that, that have survived do make appearances in present day. And there's really like new characters that show up like Dalimar um, who are just incredible. Uh, you'll love them. Uh, but this one is where Raceland has claimed a dark cursed tower of magic uh, and he has become, by doing so, the master of the past, present, and future. Uh, and this story involves everybody, like I just said, and spans the time prior to the cataclysm all the way into the future, beyond what we have seen up to that point. Um, and it's basically about how Raceland schemes to become a god by killing the Queen of Darkness and taking her mantle for himself. Now, at least on its surface, that's what it's about. It's really about redemption, love, and sacrifice. Uh, the final three books of the series are some of the best I've ever read in a genre, and there is still one line in this series that 
if I read it out loud, it chokes me up, and it is, and I'm just, I'm going to get emotional. It's Look Raced Bunnies, okay? If you read the book, you will know why I get choked up, because it's very touching, it's very emotional, and I get choked up every damn time I read it. Just saying it, Look Raced Bunnies, makes me get choked up. Um, but it's really, really strange. Strong. It's really powerful. Um, I wish I could read this to my kids again today, but I've, right now I've got them interested in Harry Potter. So I'm hoping that, that after that Fargan series is over, I can get them into Dungeon, you know, Dragonlance. Um, this is just a powerful, moving series, and, and you'll not look at RPGs the same way ever again. You know, because most RPGs or video game stuff, it, it, it's like mediocre books. And and if you want to know the facts, the magic system of Kryn. It's pretty complex. It's it, you know yes, it's Dungeons and Dragons, but they added a lot of elements to it. Like you've got to be, you know, really in touch with your alignment, okay? Because you wear you pick your robes, and Raceland is the only mage I think, other than Fistantilius, who was like the greatest mage after Raceland, who wore all three colors. And basically, you wear white. If you're good, you wear red if you're neutral, and you wear black if you are evil. And if you are evil wearing black ro white robes, your spells don't work. They don't have as much power or efficiency. And when there are three moons in the sky, uh, Lunatare and Solari and so, so on and so forth, Nutari, um, as they are in the sky, and, the, and there's the black moon, um, the, the dark wizards have more power. And when the white one's in the sky... The white wizards have more power, and they have um, different power, different towers. You know the towers of magic, and some of the towers of magic have been destroyed and repurposed, or just left to, to rot. So by the end of the, the the beginning of the series, there's really only two towers of magic I think left. Uh, there's the the high tower in, in Palanthus, uh, and then there's Raceland's tower and and the Curse Tower. Uh, and those are the only ones that are left out of the five that were built, I think, originally. Uh, and, and that plays a part, too. So, like, the magic system is really cool. The fact that they can't use gold because gold is pretty much worthless. They want steel. So the people trade in steel coins because you can make weapons out of steel coins. There are things that are just so well thought out uh, that you, you don't get that. Even, like, you know, and I'll, I'll say it. You know, I like Dark Sun a lot, and I, I like Spelljammer, and I, I've liked, and I love Forgotten Realms. But Forgotten Realms is just a generic fantasy world. Dragonlance is very distinctive and a, a flavor unto itself. Eberron, I could have cared less about. It, it's, it's not impressive. Ravenloft, it was a good concept, but it was executed so crappily. Um, I mean, seriously, I don't know. The books I've read from Ravenloft were just. I don't know. I'm a horror fan, and they, they were not horror books to me. They were kind of like uh, Dungeons and Dragons with like a, a little smattering of horror to them. And it just did not work real well. When you have like a book like, you know, um, based on Strahd von Zarovich, you know, the, the most powerful evil vampire that ever lived, and it's like, <sighs> okay. And I think the only one that really worked at all was the two. That were, you know, the Knight of the Black Rose, which were based on Lord Soth uh, from Dragonlance, because even he got sucked into Ravenloft for a little while. But again, that was one of those little cash grabs that they were doing. Um, so, th th you know, the series, like I say, it produces two of the best characters Tasselhoff Burfoot, Raisel Majir. Trust me, you read them, you won't forget about them. The narration on these books, I have to be honest with you, it's better than average, but there is one thing that just drives me crazy, and that is. Both narrators get the pronunciation of certain names wrong. Like I said, I've met some of the author. I've not met some of them. I met the authors. I was actually, you know, around when the books were first coming out. I've watched Tracy Hickman physically play Fizban. I know I'm not mistaken on how these names are said. And there's no reason why a narrator cannot take five minutes and go look up how to pronounce a name or ask if they can get Laura Lana's full Elvish name correct and say it nice and smoothly there's no reason they cannot say taz instead of taz taz said that drove me insane it's not taz it's tass short for tasselhoff not david hasselhoff it'd be Hass. if it was this is tass so honestly if you want to know the truth of the matter 
the, the narration is almost, I'm going to say almost, totally irrelevant to the story. Trust me, the book does have a bit of a slow start. I mean, you have a little bit of setup, but again, it's done within two chapters. It's not like you've got four hours of listening to get into. It's like two chapters in, they're on the run, and you are into the story. And it only gets better as it goes along. There are some things you'll ask questions about, and you know, like for example, Kitiara has this this hold over Tannis, uh, and the only thing it could be, you know, because you know he, he's with her, it, it has to be a sexual thing because he has no emotional ties to her whatsoever. But he is like so whipped. Anything Kitiara does, he is fine with it. He goes along with it, and I'm thinking this is the guy that leads this group, and he can't get out from underneath her thumb. Seriously, it, she just has to have an amazing. Well, I'm not going to go there, but that, that's it. It just has to be this sexual thing that you just can, you can't overcome. Um, you know, I don't do much with that down there, Gilbert. But and that guy down there has a PhD, okay? But I don't make him let let him make decisions, okay? Just honestly, um, I could have walked away from Kitty R and her craziness a long time before Tannis ever did, and I'm drawn to crazy. I mean, just ask my wife. Love you, baby. You know it. So, um, anyway, this is one of those series that once you finish it, you're going to want to go out and get all the other millions of books that spun off. And again, I'm going to reiterate, just don't do it. Uh, everything else that comes out of here is just total crap. And again, the, the Lord Soth stuff, and Soth is probably one of the greatest evil villains that ever shows up in a series. Um, you'll, you'll just be amazed at how menacing he is, how real he is, his backstory is killer uh like i say there are there is so much there is so much thought put into the characters uh you almost think they, they've made the characters before they ever built the world and i know that's not the case they did it the other way around they made the world first and then they made the characters uh but dang if they didn't do a good job with these characters um you know I, i've even got filler books to, to flesh out this stuff and the original six are simply lightning in a bottle they came out one after another boom 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 and they were all incredible and intense and amazing. And to me, you know, you just have to read these in order from one to six to get the full effect. And as books go, these are tens all the way around, in my opinion. Again, I'm not going to score them here, but if I had to, I would say they were tens. Uh, the narration, I, I would probably knock it down like a 9.4 because uh, the narration is not bad. But again, they, they do things that just drive me insane with the the pronunciations of names but otherwise the narration is pretty good too um but again i'm not scoring this i'm just just throwing it out there for you um, i really love this series and i think of all the game worlds this is probably my favorite probably my absolute all-time favorite so i do have a couple of things that'll be coming up i've got far cry i've got five nights at freddy's i've got war god um I've got a couple, I've got a Forgotten Realms, uh, I've got Ravenloft, I've got Gamma World. So I've got a lot of books I can pull from right now for this, if you guys like this series, this segment I should say. Um, I hope you do because I think it's, it's really neat to kind of like look at the, the games themselves sometimes and not just the, the books that are about games. Um, and it won't all just be RPG stuff. You know, a lot of those like, like will be from video games. Uh, but I just want you to know, you know, this is like something I think is important to to do just so you can kind of say this this series is worth looking at if I like this game. OK, and, and you know, it, it can only help out fleshing out your, your lit RPG uh, desire. You know, you might have a time where as hard as it is for me to believe uh, with all the releases we get, there might be a time where you don't have anything, that you're, you know, that you're waiting for. Uh, and this would be a good shot for you to go get like one of those books and try them out. These books are incredible. I, I say get them in print or get them in an Audible or do both. Um, I'm going to say Audible because it is really good. I've got like I said, I've got them on MP3, CDs, audio, Audible itself. I have them, you know, you, you name it, I probably have it. And the only other series of books I have like that are the, the Monster Hunter series from Larry Korea. So, you know, and I have everything on, that he's ever put out in that, that format. And whatever format it was, I've got them all from the Monster Hunters. So um, this is it. But just get the first six books and then leave it be. You'll want to go back. You'll want to revisit. Uh, and 
just take it from me. You don't need to. You don't want to. But check this this series out. It is really incredible, and I don't want to make Ramon's head melt by having the the six books all pop up at some point. And I hate to do that to him. But these are true true soul gems. Okay, just true soul gems. Uh, you will just love them. So give them a shot. There's a lot more. I just glossed over it, and I know I'm probably running longer on this segment. Next segment, I do on this series, um, not in this series, but on, on this segment, um, will probably be the regular length of one of the other reviews. But I wanted to throw this in here as a special thank you um, because th- you do need to get you know a broader sense of what's out there from these other books. So, And if I can help out in that way, I'm going to give you at least three books every week for Lit RPG or Game Lit. And then I'll have, like, you know, what else have they done? Or I'll have, you know, the game worlds. Or I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do something else for you. But Is It Lit is going to be, like, another one coming up soon. So just keep your eye out, and we'll see what we can do. Well, that's our show today. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'd like to thank you so very much for doing so. I do appreciate it when you take the time to watch or listen to the show. Uh, if you would like to support the program, and I hope you do, uh, I'd ask if you could to please like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page. We do have those. Uh, or just share and like this video. That helps a lot, too. It gets the, the message out there, so to speak. Uh, I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed our show. Uh, please leave comments or suggestions in the section below down there. That down there, Gilbert. Um, and feel free to tell me whatever you think about the show. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. You can tell me I suck or my haircut is really crappy. Uh, I will take the feedback to heart and try to do what I can to make things better next time around. Uh, I'd like to remind you that you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. So remember, please leave a uh, review for any book that you have listened to or read. Authors really depend on those reviews. Thank you very much, everyone, for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray. Keep listening.